Hey guys, uh, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, so my name is FJ, I'm a co-founder of a tech, tech company out here in the Bay Area called Imply, and one of the original authors behind Apache Druid. Uh, so my talk today is really about building an end-to-end -end streaming analytics stack with a couple of different open source technologies. Uh, in particular, I want to cover a couple of things. Uh, one, I want to cover kind of the evolution of data architecture, why we start, why we're looking at building these end-to-end -end streaming analytics stacks, and then I want to talk about a very high-level idea of plugging a couple of different pieces of architecture together, notably uh, Kafka for message delivery, Flink for data processing, and then Druid for serving queries. And the goal, of course, is to be able to work on a continuous stream of events. So uh, just a little context preamble. This is kind of the view I have on the evolution of analytics. Uh, the old world, as I've seen it, you guys are probably all familiar with this. You guys all know what a data warehouse is. These have been tremendously popular for many decades, kind of ubiquitous across every enterprise. Uh, really, I would say over the course of the last 10 years, um, trying to use a warehouse for all of your analytic needs has been increasingly getting less popular as people have realized there's a lot more you can do with data that a warehouse can't really uh, solve. So I call this the less old world. You guys are probably also very familiar with this as well. This is the data lake. Uh, this is the architecture that has been becoming very popular, I think, or is very popular really over the course of the last 10 years. It's an architecture that really separates this notion of storage and compute. So you basically have a central storage system, something like HDFS or Amazon S3 or many others. Uh, and then you have different query systems that are designed for different use cases, kind of talking to the same data lake. Uh, the idea is you might have a more modern data warehouse, something like a Presto or a Snowflake. You might have machine learning, uh, AI engines, something like Spark. You might have your enterprise search engine. And really, all data is kind of consolidated in a central storage location. Uh, this model has worked great. I think really every company I talk to has this somewhere in place. Uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft all offer this as part of their cloud offering as well. Um, the one limitation, of course, of the data lake is, as I'm sure you guys know, all data is thought of as being in batches. And really, you're just working with a bunch of static files in this model. And the new world really doesn't think of data as just as static files. The new world thinks of data as a continuous stream of events. And this is because there's a lot of different forms of data that get created as basically a continuous stream of events. And in this new world, uh, there's a new architecture that I believe is emerging. Uh, I've just called it a data river for now. I don't know if that name's going to catch on, but I hope it does. Uh, the idea is there's a couple of different pieces in this model uh, similar to a data lake world. So in this world, typically you have a stream hub or a message broker or a message bus. Apache uh, Kafka obviously being kind of the most popular open source project that's really designed to not only store kind of events, but really transfer them from one place to another. Uh, you have your stream processors now. This is the Flink conference. You guys are familiar with Flink. Flink is a stream processor. It's really designed to be able to transform and manipulate a continuous stream of events. And there's now new query engines. Uh, I work on a project called Apache Druid. Um, Druid is a new form of query engine really designed to think of data and work of data as a continuous stream of events. So uh, the stack I want to talk about really has kind of three pieces. Uh, each of these three pieces are designed to solve kind of three different problems. The first problem is around event delivery. How do you get a, a discrete events from one place to another? Uh, the second problem is around event processing. This is what Flink is very good at. Uh, this is how do you transform raw data in a format that's more consumable. And then the third one is querying. You know, what is a more modern database that's centered around event-driven data actually look like? Um, the reason why I talk about three different systems is each of these problems is very difficult to accomplish at scale. Even delivering events from one place to another is very difficult to do when you have a lot of data. So the, the stack is going to look something like this. Uh, I'm going to talk about each piece individually. Uh, I, I think I only have 20 minutes for this talk, so I'm only going to cover high level what each of these three pieces is designed to do. And we start with data, data delivery. So as I mentioned, the idea behind data delivery systems is it's uh, really you have this idea of things producing data and then things consuming data. And the purpose of the delivery system is to get events from where they're produced to where they're going to be consumed. Um, data delivery systems, really, I think Kafka is the most popular system here. Uh, there's 
AWS Kinesis and Azure, there's PubSub, kind of each of the public cloud providers have their own, own variation. Um, in data delivery at scale, there's a couple of different challenges. Uh, the most notable one is how do you guarantee that events are going to be delivered when there's outages, when there's problems? So if you have network outages, you have machines going down, how do you ensure that you don't drop data? If the thing that's producing data goes down or the thing that's consuming data goes down, how do you try and make sure that those failures don't impact one another? Um, other data delivery challenges consists of what happens when we don't have a single consumer of data, what happens when we have many consumers. So you have data getting created, you may have a lot of downstream systems that need to consume this data. Oh, sorry. And of course, uh, high availability and scale, something always present when you're working with uh, more web scale, enterprise scale data. So uh, data delivery, really, I think Kafka is the most popular, kind of ubiquitous choice there. Uh, it has a very full, straightforward, reliable design. Um, it's, it's kind of message, it's designed really as uh, a pub sub queue. Um, there's this notion of a separation between things that produce data and things that consume data. And then Kafka, Kafka basically asks, asks, acts as an intermediate storage. So the idea is if you have the things that consume data if they go down, they're not impacting the things that are producing data and vice versa. So there's buffers to uh, load incoming data to give consumers time to consume it. So if you have spikes of data, if you have um, high volume or low volume data, it's really pretty resi resilient to, to different things that can happen in production. Uh, nowadays, Kafka also has uh, exactly once event delivery guarantees. So if you're writing to Kafka, you can now do so exactly once, uh, which is very, very powerful because it's really minimizing the ETL for cleaning up duplicates and, and things of that nature. So uh, Kafka, I think, really great piece for data delivery. Uh, usually, you just have producers running on your machines. You feed data into Kafka. And then the next stage of, of the stack is around processing. So, Stream processing, now a pretty popular concept. There's many different types of stream processors. Flink is a very popular one. There's Spark Streaming, there's Kafka Streams, uh, there, there are, there's others out there. Um, but the purpose of stream processors, the number one use I see of them out in the wild and in production is around cleaning the imperfections of raw data. So raw data has many imperfections. It's usually not usable as is. Um, Oftentimes what the processing systems are doing is they're applying business logic, they're replacing you know, maybe machine generated values with human readable ones. They might be doing more complex operations like joining multiple streams together. Uh, stream processing has its own set of challenges. Um, the first generation of stream processors actually suffer from many challenges at scale. Uh, more modern stream processors have really solved some of these challenges. Uh, the biggest challenge is being able to efficiently apply multiple operations on an unbounded sequence of events. So if you think about how you may transform or manipulate data, you might be you know, replacing null values with some default value. You might be replacing some ID with a more human readable string. Um, you might be joining kind of multiple streams together. Each of these operations can have very different resource requirements. Replacing one string with another string doesn't require a lot of resource requirements. Joining two large streams at scale can require a lot of different types of resource requirements. So good string processors really should be able to solve problems like this. And obviously high availability and, high availability and scale is something that's kind of present in every single stream processor. Um, stream processing with Flink, uh, you know, this is an idea not just with Flink, but kind of all good stream processors. You should be able to break up your processing logic basically into a set of logical stages or tasks, and each task can be assigned its own resource requirements. Uh, a task that's joining two streams together can have a different set of resource requirements than a task that's kind of replacing a string value. Uh, and then these tasks are joined together to form an end-to-end -end data pipeline. So usually when you're transforming data, you're putting multiple tasks in a sequence together. So yeah, um, you have raw data, it's getting sent to a system like Kafka, it's getting transformed now into a system like Flink, and this data is now in a state where it can be queried. Um, a lot of stream processors do support the ability to query the stream directly. Uh, kind of one drawback, one drawback there is really a lot of your queries actually get transformed into tasks, and the data is not stored in any format that's really optimized for different types of analytic queries. 
So I think some of the more sophisticated uh, streaming analytics stacks actually have a dedica dedicated query layer. You're basically leveraging a system like Flink just for data transforms, and then you're taking that transform data and storing it somewhere else where the data can be stored in a format that's gonna be very, very optimized for queries. And this is sort of the idea behind the querying layer. Um, so data querying. So data querying, um, most querying systems tend to be data, databases of some sort. Uh, the more, I think, stream-friendly databases can do streaming ingest, so, you, it can, uh, so these databases can handle uh, a continuous flow of data. It can actually store that data, not just for a window period of time, but actually can store it for potentially years, depending on the use case and the retention that's needed. Um, I think some of the more difficult data querying challenges is actually being able to do exactly once ingest. So if you have data that's you know, being processed by Flink, how do you load it into a querying system in a way that data doesn't get dropped or duplicated? Um, anytime you're working with a, a real-time stream of data, your query also changes. You know, I've seen data pipelines where people are pushing real-time data into a data warehouse but data warehouses are not typically designed for ad hoc analysis. They're not designed to explore why an anomaly is happening or alert or detect uh, or, or do root cause analysis on, on immediate data. So I think for a da good data querying system, it needs to be able to do low latency ad hoc analytics. And of course, availability and scale is important here. Um, I'm very biased. I think that Druid is a really great system as sort of the end of this data pipeline as the end of the stack uh, is something that's collecting a stream of data and then making that data available for queries. Uh, so Druid is a system that's really designed to handle all different forms of event-driven data. It's designed to work out of the box with actually uh, systems like Kafka and Flink. Uh, it actually supports exactly once ingest from Kafka, Kinesis, and anything that kind of looks like Kafka. And then it's a system that really combines ideas from data warehouses, time series databases, and also log search systems. So it's designed to kind of do all different types of flows on event-driven data. And it can also retain data uh, for a lot of years. Um, so yeah, I don't have all the time to kind of talk about the architecture of each of these systems, but what I thought I would do is actually give you a real case example. Uh, so this is an example uh, in online advertising about how you can combine these technologies together and build an end-to-end -end stack for advertising analytics. So uh, as an example, uh, in, in the advertising world, you know, online advertising obviously pays for like half the jobs in Silicon Valley because there's so many web companies. Uh, there's kind of two main data sets that are important in online advertising. One is impressions, which is people looking at ads, and the other is clicks, which is people clicking on ads. And usually what most companies that work with ads want to understand is for people that viewed an ad, how many of them actually clicked on that ad. Uh, and the tricky part is impressions and clicks are actually both very large kind of event streams, and they're two separate event streams. So what we actually want to do is we want to be able to leverage our stream processor to join impressions with clicks. Uh, we want to do some cleanup of the data, for example, mapping advertiser IDs to actual names, uh, mapping geo IPs and long longitude and latitude to actual locations, and other kind of processes. So uh, what our data set is, so what our example is going to start with is with Kafka. So we're going to actually have Kafka uh, producers sitting on our ad servers. They're going to be collecting data about impressions and clicks. And we're going to have two different topics in Kafka, impressions and clicks. And at the end of the day, what we're going to do is we're going to load this data into Druid uh, where it can be easily uh, queried. So uh, the idea is advertising data might look something like this. You might have... Uh, in, in impression where basically there's a key associated with it and then later on there's a click of that ad with the same key. Uh, the tricky part is where the impression exists and, and where the click exists are in two different topics and also potentially two different partitions or multiple different partitions within the same topic. Uh, so what we can do with Flink is we can create basically a shuffle step and the shuffle step is going to try and co-locate the data that we're going to join eventually join together. And the output of the Flink job is another topic into Kafka called shuffled. 
Um, the idea looks something like this. Basically, we're going to take the impressions. We're going to find all the uh, impressions and clicks that have the same ID, the same identifier, and put them in the same partition in Kafka. This way, we can do a join as part of a next step. So the next job that we actually end up creating in Flink is the join job. And this is a pretty simple job where what it does is it replaces um, the impression event and the click event, and we merge them together into a single event, and we basically add a new attribute, which is, is click true. So the idea is if we find an impression and then we have a click with the same key, we combine these together. If after some period of time we don't see a corresponding click, then we mark is clicked is false. Um, so at the end of the join job, we create a fourth topic that's in Kafka, which is this join topic. And it's really at this point, uh, we can create yet another job in Flink, which is to apply all the business logic. So this is to do the string replacements. This is to do null value replacements. It's to do all that kind of more lightweight, simple stuff to make the data uh, human readable. And at the end of that, we can actually write data from Flink directly into Druid. Uh, at this point, uh, Druid is going to stream in the data and then store it long term and act as the interface in which users and, and BI tools and whatever else is going to talk to. Um, so the kind of nice part about a model like this is we're doing a join of two very large streams, um, basically with our stream processor. We're not relying on the database to do that. Uh, if you've ever tried to do a join impressions and clicks through a uh, through queries on a database side, they can be extremely slow. They can take you know, 30 minutes up to hours in order to complete. Uh, so what we're doing instead is we're letting the stream processor actually create a single large normalized cleaned up data set, and that's what's actually getting queried. So uh, to kind of summarize the talk, so each of the three technologies I talked about, Kafka, Flink, Druid, they're all part of the Apache Software Foundation. They're all open source. You can actually, they're all designed to kind of work with one another. You can download any of these, plug it together, and build this end-to-end -end stack. Uh, the use case I talked about in advertising is just one simple use case. There's many, many applications of, of this technology across many different verticals. So thanks, guys. I think I have about two minutes, so maybe I can take a question or two. <laughs> uh, Uh, in the in the diagram, you uh, you have a previous page. Yeah. Uh, so why why would you um, write to Kafka and back first instead of just one pipeline? Sorry. Why would you have three like three shuffling shuffle join in your hands and writing to Kafka and back and processing again, write to Kafka and back processing again? So what's the consideration writing three instead of just one thing? Uh, what's the what's the consideration of basically writing kind of multiple steps here as opposed to like a single step that uh, does everything? Step is just a single job. A single job that yeah, does everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is something that can be done. This is just kind of one example. Um, the model I'm actually using here can apply not just to Flink, but it can apply to uh, different, different stream processors. And another kind of consideration here is the resource requirements for each of these steps may be very different. So if you think of a shuffle step as being kind of independent tasks, you can potentially allocate a different set of resources for this step versus the join step. Like a join step could be a very heavy step, and that can potentially require much more resources like an enhancer output step. So it's really kind of up to you. You can actually write a single job to do all of this. I think in practice, when you have a lot of data, when you're trying to diagnose issues, it can be a little bit complicated to, to try and to diagnose issues if your job is trying to do too much. But it's really, I think, up to the preference of the developer. Uh, so to follow up that, uh, what do you use to actually uh, stream the data into Druid? Right. Uh, so the question is, yeah, what do you use to stream the data into Druid? Uh, so there's actually a couple ways that data can be streamed into Druid. So one is Druid can actually talk to Kafka directly. So there could be actually another job which writes a new topic into Kafka, and then Druid pulls data from Kafka. Druid supports exactly one suggest from Kafka, so we guarantee kind of no loss of data, no duplication of data. So that's one way. Uh, there's also libraries where you can... Uh, basically have Flink at the end of a job push data directly into Druid. Um, that has, the, the, the availability guarantees aren't as high as you pull data directly from Kafka, but it's also an option, something that people do. Right here. Yeah. Um, so 
some some operations, mainly aggregations, can be done in both yeah. um, both places. Flink, yeah. Flink can do that, windowing and whatnot. Yeah. And Druid does that yeah. uh, kind of out of the box. What's your take on where should the aggregation happen? Uh, like there's, you, you can do it both ways and maybe the consideration is around like maybe you have multiple destinations and not only Druid, how, how do you look at it? Yeah, uh, so the way, the way I look at it is really about your performance requirements. So the way that almost all stream processors kind of support aggregations is a SQL query basically gets converted into some sort of stream processing job. And within the stream processor itself, the data is not really stored in any format that's kind of optimized for queries. So if performance isn't an issue or if your data volume isn't very high, you don't need kind of a dedicated querying system. But the idea of something like Druid is it stores data kind of in a column orientation. It builds all different forms of indexes. It's really designed to accelerate the queries. Uh, and unlike a stream processor, you know, it's natively supporting some of those computations. It's not converting a computation into like a stream processing job that's then running on top of the data. Uh, and that leads to like pretty significant performance differences. So if you'd imagine a case where you're doing user retention, like you're working with the click streams and you're trying to, you know, do retention, you're trying to build funnels, that can be a pretty expensive query that, where you do it directly in the stream processor. Another consideration is Druid can uh, retain data long term. It's like hyper optimized storage format, means that you can uh, really start issuing queries where you kind of look at what's happening right now, compare that against what happened like a year into the past. But mostly on, uh, on the aggregation, on write to yeah. Druid, right? Because like I can say that uh, I want my minimum granularity would be one minute, right? I yeah. can do that. Um, on Druid when the right aggregation happens, or yeah. I can do that with Flink, Flink, right? Yeah, so the idea is if you're doing like simple counters, like if you're actually just doing simple counters, the difference might be not as visible. If you're doing like complex multi-dimensional group buys, then it should be, you know, the difference will be pretty, pretty different. Any other questions? Thanks everyone. All right, thanks a lot of Jay.